He believes the Egyptians cut this stone using a soft metal, copper. Stocks has built replica copper chisels based on ancient artifacts found in Egypt. By using those, I feel that I am as close as I can get within the mind of ancient Egyptian workers and how they felt. But copper is a soft, malleable metal which bends and blunts easily. How can it be used to cut limestone? Now, the tools that I have in my hand at the moment are the first ones that the ancient craftsmen would use. And this one is a mallet, which is used to strike this copper tool, which is shaped into a chisel. And in order to do this, you lay the chisel against the stone at an angle, position the mallet, and then strike. Quite hard blows, and you will see big chips of stone coming away. That's all right for rough working, but we have another copper chisel which can be used for more finer working in order to get much less stone off at a time, but will bring the surface closer towards the surface which is totally flat. Stock's research shows that it's possible to carve limestone blocks using soft copper chisels. And it turns out that the Egyptians were the unwitting recipients of some good fortune. Detailed chemical analysis of ancient tools shows that Egyptian copper wasn't pure. It contained small traces of arsenic. By a lucky chance, this impurity holds the copper crystals together and actually makes this copper tougher than its pure form. This fluke of chemistry helped the Egyptian stonemasons quarry most of the 2.3 million limestone blocks in the Great Pyramid. The pyramids are mostly made of the relatively soft rock limestone. But the Egyptians also used a much tougher kind of stone, granite. They used this hard, beautifully colored stone for the most important sections of the design such as the king's chamber within the Great Pyramid. And copper chisels have absolutely no effect on this rock. Sophisticated modern quarrying tools can cut through granite, but the Egyptians had not even learned how to forge iron. Generations of archaeologists could not solve the puzzle of exactly how they cut these 50-ton granite blocks. But now, experimental archaeology is beginning to explain this technological mystery. Dennis Stocks thinks he has the answer. He believes the Egyptians did use copper, copper saws. And not just ordinary saws. They didn't even have teeth. This material here is very hard granite. And to cut this, you need a special tool. And this is a copper saw, but it's toothless. It's got no teeth at all. And you say, well, what's going to do the cutting? Well, it's sand, but it's the quartz crystals within the sand which embed themselves into the softer copper. And because the saw's dragging those crystals backward and forth within the slot, that actually does the cutting. And slowly, bit by bit, the stone is cut right the way through. Quartz crystals in the sand are so hard that they gradually grind through the solid granite. But using these saws, the ancient Egyptians could only have cut granite at a rate of two cubic inches an hour. It still would have taken four months to carve out the sarcophagus inside the Great Pyramid. With soft copper and a cutting edge provided by arsenic and sand, the Egyptians cut vast quantities of rock. They had to then assemble these blocks into a monument that could stand the test of time. But what made the Egyptians decide to build a pyramid in the first place? Why did they... Once in position, the builders faced a new task. The blocks had to be fitted together. Surprisingly, in such a precise build, a large proportion of the internal stones were just roughly finished. The gaps between them were filled with rubble and gypsum mortar. 
In between the blocks were stuffed lots of limestone chippings mixed with a huge dollops of mortar. And it sets just like modern concrete. But every stone that would be visible when the build was completed was placed with amazing precision. In the Great Pyramid, the blocks of the burial chamber fit precisely. The sides of these blocks had to be almost perfectly flat to make these astonishing joins. This precision engineering was achieved using the most rudimentary of tools. Yes, we'll use this rods and string tool in order to find out whether the surface is truly flat. And by using a third rod, which is the same length as the other two rods joined by the string, which is now pulled very taut, we can see if it just slips under. Now, we've got a bit of a high spot there. Now, in ancient times, they would mark that simply by putting some red oak on just to remind the workers where to go to and check along the length of the string. The ancient mason would use the rods and string to spot imperfections and then mark them with red ochre to show where more work was needed. Using two further tools, this one being a flint scraper and this one being a sandstone rubber, now we can use the marks as a guide to scrape away the high point like so. And it's obvious that as you scrape, the mark disappears, and with it, of course, the high spot. This same technique was also used in the final stage of construction. The rough internal blocks were covered with an outer casing of perfectly smooth stone. This was carved from the highest grade limestone and had to be carried across the Nile to the pyramid site. <laughs> 